Hi, and welcome back to The Real News Network. My name is Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III. We're having a wonderful conversation about a tragedy in this nation, the murder of Michael Brown and Ferguson, uh, and, and the ripples from Ferguson. Where do we go from here? Our special guest today is Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr., and we're so thankful again for your time today. The conversation me. has been hot, and it's about to get more hotter, if I can say <laughs> that, uh, because we have just a, a wonderful um, guest audience here today, and so many in this crowd, and not just uh, audience members, but they're activists, spoken word artists, doing many business leaders, doing so many wonderful things as well. I want to take a moment and introduce um, a few of them. Everybody in the audience is going to be now. This part of the show is going to be us engaging back and forth. There's microphones in the audience, so let's get at it, okay? We, we broke at the half talking about voting. And uh, Reverend Yearwood, you said that voting is the most radical thing we can do right now. You said that the right wing really got upset yep. uh, when two mothers set up a voter registration booth. They didn't mind the burning down of the gas station or the other things or the looting. Some would call it looting, others would call it reparations, but yep. they didn't mind none of that. Um, but when two mothers set up a table and did voter registration, that's when they got upset. You saw that as a sign of that's where the real power is. And I alluded to the fact that I believe that some in this audience would say, uh, different. And I want to give voice to that. Uh, Kariga Bailey, I think you were one who had a difference of opinion as it relates to voting. Is that right? The idea is that if voting is the most revolutionary thing we can do, I can't say that I found the recourse. I can't say that I found exactly what would replace voting. I'm just saying how long does it take for us to groom someone who we choose to vote for, who we know will serve the interests of the people. Um, so that revolution is a little longer than I'd like to wait. Uh, but I do understand that my patience is something I must develop. Uh, but I also say this, I don't know if I really have the true hope that things will change. I just know I'm armored with a glitch and I don't know how to stop fighting. So I count toward the change, but I can't say with certainty that I believe it's coming. So, so Brother Bailey make, makes a great point. It says, uh, if, if, if voting is the answer, Rev, uh, it's a long time coming, and even with the historic election of uh, our president, President Barack Obama, um, many of the things that, uh, from Michael Brown to Trayvon Martin, many of this and so many other, Eric Garner, Venetia McBride, the list really could go on and on and on. Under this president, the one who said hope and change and yes we can, um, things at least on the ground have not seemed to change as substantively as was initially promised, at least for some. What do you say to those who say, listen, I'm tired of waiting? Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I definitely understand the sentiment. And I understand, you know, being revolutionary, unfortunately, means you have to be patient. Um, it is a long term. It's one of the things that sometimes that the battle will go on beyond you. You have to literally prepare your children, literally, to fight the next phase of the battle. And that's hard because, you know, we don't think we, we want to see it now. And some things will come now. Um, but then some things will be done for the next generation. The, the other Ferguson, actually, we should talk about, which is, you know, Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson is Homer, Homer Plessy, who's the, the light-skinned young brother who boarded the train in New Orleans in 1892 and is stopped. And then that literally creates, you know, separate but equal laws, creates Jim Crow, creates segregation. Um, and then from there, we needed to have um, litigation and legislation um, come forth next, um, Civil Rights Act um, uh, and, and uh, Brown v. Board of Education. Um, those things came after that process about 50 years later. What's important to know that those communities who were against the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, they didn't stop. They were patient. And so for an example of that would be, you know, John, John Roberts, uh, Chief John Roberts now, um, you know, in, in 83, he was a Harvard Law student, and the, the Reagan and those communities groomed him, literally from 83. 30 years later, he's now on the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he's now rolling back voting rights. So they have patience, and so they recognize that it is a systematic planning. So while we're dealing with the other Ferguson, our Ferguson, they are still trying to create not only separate but equal, but separate but unequal. And so our only level of leveling the playing field is through voting. Now, I would say there are, there are other 
things we could do. I would say there's divestment. I mean, taking our money out of, out of corporations, the prison industrial complex, companies that are polluting our companies, are polluting our communities. Um, there's a, there are other tools that we can use along with voting divestment. Clearly, and I wouldn't say you're right. I like how you say it wasn't rioting. It's, it was the Ferguson uprising. And the, and the resistance in Ferguson, we can support that in the next generation. But voting is critical. It is our most important means right now. If we utilize it, in other words, to, to level the playing field on a political basis. But I think what, what was being kind of stated was that we then have politicians um, who get into positions of authority, who look like us, um, who come from our community, they get in those positions um, and then they don't do what they're called to, upon doing. And that is frustrating. So we, I, I actually agree wholeheartedly. We do need to groom out of the resistance um, a new set of leaders um, to be in those positions of authority. Can I do a quick poll, in fact, of that, based on that statement that the Reverend said, so I, can, so I can see beyond our brother, Brother Bailey, who shared, I do a quick poll of those who disagree with the statement that voting is the most revolutionary or radical thing we can do. Can I see the hands of those who disagree? I disagree with that statement. I disagree with it. I disagree. All right. Siv, can, can we hear from, from you on why you disagree with that statement? Um, it's, I don't think it's the most radical. For me, I come from the thought of um, economic withhold. Um, I believe um, America is a capitalistic country. I think if we as a community, especially black folks who spend a lot of money, we're one of the biggest consumers in America. I think if we starve America's capitalistic hunger, that is the most radical thing that we can do. I think that uh, we'll start to see some really big change, and that is something that we can do immediately. With the voting, it's still needed. It's definitely still needed. I don't count that out. But if you think about voting, you said in 2013 it was only 6%. It's going to take four more years before you can see some type of political change in that city of Ferguson because of the way the, the laws are written. And I agree, like people say vote, 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 but who are we voting for? Who are, what are we voting for? D the Hip Hop Caucus, I understand that you guys are based out in DC, but are you touring these little um, towns or are you seeing the political structure of these towns like a Ferguson? Why did it take Mike Brown's killing for us to realize that this is a place that is 60% black, but their leadership does not represent that. Where are the, the, these caucuses and these political organizations looking at the structure of these cities and saying, hold on, there's something going on right here. We need to go to these cities and get the, the people in these cities educated and really for them to understand what is going on, how we are throwing our political powers away. So, I don't think that voting is a radical, uh, the most radical thing for me is withholding our finances, um, not purchasing or patronizing those places that don't patronize us. Interesting, Rev. Uh, sister Siv makes a great. My sister makes a great point. Um, you've been working on a national level. Can you yep. point to any small town like a Ferguson or a Sanford where on the ground voter registration and the like has worked to? redistribute political power in a small town and really change on the ground reality for people? Oh, most definitely. I mean, there's, there's Newark, New Jersey, um, currently. I mean, there's a litany of cities that, that I can, we can say Oakland. Um, but I think the point with, I'm not against divestment or withholding our, our money. I think though there, again, there is an institutional educational component around that. That is much, that's not as easy, easily done as, as said. And I do think we do need to begin educating our community, not only to withhold their money, in other words, divest, but then to invest their money into our community, our organizations, and also invest their money into um, organizations or institutions that are supporting them. This has nothing against the church mm -hmm. or the mosque, but a lot of times we put a lot of money into our churches and they're not doing what needs to be done um, for our community, but we are constantly investing in that. So we need to we hold our money even from those within our own community who aren't putting forth a plan um, that needs to create change. But I, I still think that voting is the one thing that um, we can quickly, it's something that you can do and educate our community to do. In other words, it's a broad-based process. If we were voting 
in essence, at 96%, let's flip the coin, and we were not seeing the results, then I would probably, I would probably be more inclined to say, okay, I can understand that this might not be the top priority. But because it's the lower number, using Ferguson, Ferguson is a great example that they had, and, and again, I don't want to make, make this strictly because you can vote for who you want to. In other words, I'm not saying vote for a black person because they're black, because we recognize there are a lot of black people who are not for black people. And so I'm saying vote for good people who are for your community. So if they want to vote for us, so all white city council, and the white city council is all for the people of Ferguson, but clearly after what they're saying, that is not the case. So what I'm saying here in regards to Ferguson, if you're voting at 6% in 2013, actually they vote every two years, to, to, for, and, but, but wouldn't really, it's still two years, it's still time to create that kind of change. The thing though for Ferguson is that if you're, give, you're, you're in essence giving away your, your right, your power, looking at the other side, in other words, uh, the, the, the other side who wants to take away your power. In other words, there are two sides to this. There is, in essence, those who want to organize money, and there are those who want to organize people. The good news is that organized people beats organized money when organized people are organized. And so the key thing here is that with organized people, the Koch brothers, they are funding every level. In other words, they are now funding people to be dog catchers, not just senators or governors or, or presidents of the country, but they want to make sure that every level of, of our policy making is shaped. And that's the key thing why it's the most radical aspect, because either you shape policy or policy will shape you. Let me just throw another thing in, in, in the pot as we're talking. Because speaking about responding to the movement, a lot of artists, a lot of hip hop artists, mainstream artists have also been responding to what's been going on in Ferguson, right? And so we've had, and let me make sure I get all my names right because I know they watch the Real News Network, Talib Kweli, uh, J. Cole, Rosa Clemente, Lauren Hill, David Banner, Common, John Legend, Jasiri X, Nelly T.I., so many others, in different ways have been engaging um, this issue through their music, through interviews, through T-shirts like John Legend when he did a concert the other night and that kind of thing. But you said recently there was a conference call with a lot of these artists, and I'm just you know curious for you to share what was on the minds of mainstream artists, quote unquote mainstream, and we can debate that term too. <laughs> but what was on their minds uh, in light of Ferguson? No, definitely. Let me just if I can yeah. just quickly just address what was said there. A movement is necessary, um, but a strategic movement is what what's needed. It isn't just a movement, because movements can be uh, iced out. We saw that from Occupy Wall Street. We've seen it from different movements that grow quickly and then don't sustain themselves. And also, what I'm saying is that legislation, you mentioned, you know, speaking of Missouri, Dred Scott decision in Missouri, which then it, it litigates and legislates the value of a, of a black life and a black man. And so what I'm saying to you is that, no, we definitely need organization. We definitely need demonstration. But organization and demonstration without litigation and legislation leads to frustration. And so what I'm saying is that if we're just talking about this movement building without an idea of shaping policy or changing policy, um, then it's gonna, we're going to have some bad repercussions on our part long term. But definitely a movement is critical, which is part of the call yeah. which we have with the artists. I think, you know, my job at Hip Hop Caucus is that I'm in a great position. I get to work with all types of artists. You know, I got my dear friend Immortal Technique on one side, and I work with T.I. and 2 Chains because it's the Hip Hop Caucus, and they all come together and they have these discussions. So we had a call about Ferguson. Um, and it was actually a great call. Uh, I won't say who talked about what, because it was, we have our calls that are, right. but they were, most of the artists you named were on that, on that call. Um, and so in that, you know, the discussion came up in regards to, you know, the issue of black on black um, crime, right. you know, and, and I can understand because they say why, when this is part of the leadership question, when there's a, when people say they don't, they don't see the issue around that or they don't think they see, because there are things that be, are, are being done, which I think that's the other part, things are clearly being done. The, the bottom line to that issue, which was so good to hear them discuss it amongst themselves, and the difference around this is that all of them, when they kind of, one of the artists asked the other artists, um, well, who on this call has not been profiled? Um, nobody said anything. So, 
And then the aspect that it's different because one of the artists, and I think it might have been Common or Malik Youssef, um, might have said this, and I, I'll say they said this, which was um, the difference between the black on black aspect is this. If somebody had killed, because one of the brothers just lost somebody. In other words, one of the brothers, one of the artists had just lost their cousin to gun violence. So he was, that artist was very yeah. touchy about that situation. And so um, was this, that the person who killed your cousin will go to, if caught, will go to jail. If that law enforcement officer who killed Michael Brown, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that he will go to jail. And as a matter of fact, that the fact that you can have a public execution um, in essence, and killing a young person of color with impunity, and there's no regard for that, um, then that, that's, that's the problem because the law, is, in essence, has to police the law. And it was an awesome, great, I mean, I was amazed. A lot of artists were there talking about they wish the discussion in the movement, and I think we, we are hearing that. Some of the artists were talking about that it wasn't so much focused on Michael Brown, but they actually want to know what, not only what's in the system of Michael Brown, but they ask questions like, what's in the system of Dan William, Dan, 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 Dan Wilson. Wilson. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and that's to be grateful. The major to kind of answer this is that, you know, you know, they, a lot of artists were feeling that they feel a lot of artists, policemen have ADHD. And a lot of policemen they come across are, are drunk when they come across them. Or they, what's in, their, what's in their system, you know, when they're on the job? And, and they want to actually know, what's, what are we doing to train police officers? Because always about this, what we got to do to train our community, but how are they being trained? How are they being held accountable? How are they mm -hmm. being held immeasurable? So I think those are some of the things that came up on that, on that call. call.